Jennifer Bailey has been a music teacher for over 23 years and has spent much of that time generously sharing her expertise about all things music education with the world through her presentations, her blog, singthekids.com, her YouTube channel, and the amazing resources in her Teachers Pay Teachers Shop. Her accomplishments have not gone unnoticed as she has been the recipient of many prestigious teaching awards, not the least of which was the Music Educator of the Year Award by the Michigan Music Educators Association in 2017. On the faculty of the Gordon Institute of Music Learning in elementary general and early childhood music, Jennifer is a sought after clinician in all things MLT and presents her ideas around the country. We are very lucky to have her here this morning. I'm very proud to introduce you to our presenter and my friend, Jen Bailey. Jen. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a little humbling to hear yourself uh, spoken of while you're standing here, but uh, I'm really excited to be with you this morning. And we're going to be talking about making MLT work and sequencing your instruction in the elementary general music room. Uh, as I go through this morning, if you have questions, please go ahead and type them in and uh, uh, Andy uh, will moderate questions as we go. So please don't feel uh, conscientious about asking things as we go. Um, I would love it if you would interact with me. It feels very weird to be looking into a screen and talking and not seeing all of your faces. So with all of that said, I'm gonna share a screen uh, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of our work for the morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about sequential learning, what it is and why it's important. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about learning sequence activities and uh, what really happens in our classrooms, because the truth is most of us have gone through a, a uh, professional development uh, levels course, and we learn from our instructor how to deliver LSAs, but then we get into a classroom of 25, 30 children, and what it looked like with six people versus those 30 look very, very different. So I'm going to talk all about uh, LSAs and how I do them in my classroom and, and what I do. Uh, we're going to be talking about skill learning sequence, uh, and again, what really happens in our classrooms. Um, which will be one of my favorite things to talk about. And then getting the most out of your classroom activities, how to dig deep with less repertoire. Uh, and that was really, honestly, a takeaway from an ORF level that I had, that I was doing tons and tons of songs and really scratching the surface of what I could get out of a, uh, a song or an activity. And so I'm gonna talk to you about how I really uh, pick the bone dry when it comes to the, the, the repertoire that I use in my classroom to make sure I get the most out of it in terms of content. So I would be remiss if we didn't just talk about what is music learning theory, uh, especially if you're new to this. Um, it just feels like that's something we can always revisit. Uh, and the first is that it's an explanation of how we learn music when we're learning music. And I think that's so important that we focus on the how we learn music. The we is you and I, the we is our students. It's not an explanation of how we teach music. It's an explanation of how we learn music. And it's taking the focus off of what we do as teachers and putting it on the focus of what our students are doing as learners. Uh, it consists of audiation, sequential learning, and aptitude. And my focus today is really going to be digging deep on the sequential learning piece with you. Um, and in doing so, we're gonna be talking about learning sequences. Uh, we're going to be talking about skill learning sequences, tonal and rhythm learning sequences, and then pattern learning sequences. Because if we don't understand what those are and how they work together, then what we're doing in terms of our sequential learning is not really getting the best of our uh, teaching to our students. And so we have to really understand what that is in order to ensure that we're really making the most of our work with our students. So just a real quick overview of each one. Skill learning sequence consists of discrimination learning and inference learning. We all, if you've taken a levels course, you all know aural oral. 
you, uh, and you know verbal association. Then we get to these other words that feel a little less comfortable because we don't have context in our own personal experience to understand and to apply and guide students through this. But partial synthesis, I'm hoping to take the mystery out of that with you today. It's my favorite level of discrimination learning with my students. Symbolic association is one of those ones we're all really good at because we uh, all learn how to read music. And so we feel really good about teaching kids how to, to read music and then composite synthesis. And again, because we have no context for what that was, it's not something we experienced per se in our own elementary or our own music education. And so those words don't have a lot of meaning for us. And I wanna try and demystify that for you and give you some uh, tools today to help you be able to work with your students in those areas because they really are important. Uh, inference learning, generalization, we're uh, talking about inference learning is where we're really having kids make decisions about what they're audiating musically. So they learn to generalize, they work in creativity and improvisation. And then the last piece, uh, theoretical understanding. And if you think about most music education programs, we really start with theoretical understanding first before we even uh, delve into building a foundation for music listening and music performing, speaking, thinking, uh, and reading and writing. Are we doing okay so far? Any questions? I'm not going too fast. It's great from our end. Uh, the sound is good. That We can see the slides. Everybody's, uh, we're all doing great. Okay, awesome. I feel like I better just make one more quick uh, comment about skill learning sequence. And, and this is so important. I see it over and over again with teachers, uh, pre-service teachers and, and young teachers that I work with. And that is discrimination learning always is guiding the, the student to, um, I don't want to say this. Uh, you are always teaching the student uh, what to learn and how to learn it. It is very teacher centered. Inference learning, the child must use the information they learned at discrimination learning to teach themselves. And so inference learning is more student centered. And I'll come back to that uh, later on. Tonal learning sequence. When we talk about a tonal learning sequence, and I think this is, again, one of the challenges of music learning theory is there's just so many uh, labels. And again, we don't have the context for that, but just simply your tonal learning sequence is the, the sequence in which we learn to audiate uh, tonality. So when you're looking at major tonality, the very first thing he talks about in that uh, learning sequence is pitch center or resting tone as we think of it. From there, we talk about tonic chords. And I don't mean uh, we don't describe tonic chords. I mean, we are singing tonic function to our students. Uh, and then we move into subdominant or excuse me, dominant and subdominant. Uh, so there is a sequence to getting students to audiate major tonality, starting with resting tone or pitch center, moving to tonic, dominant, subdominant, and then he mentions caden cadential, but then he also says all functions. So I feel like at the, at the point in an elementary setting, if I can get my kids uh, audiating uh, through subdominant, I've done a pretty good job as a teacher given the time restraints in, in terms of my contact time with kids. For minor, uh, Dr. Gordon talks about pitch center again, tonic, dominant, and subdominant functions, moving into cadential, and then all functions. I found this next part really interesting when I was reading. I always go back and read the book. I've probably reread re his work 30 times, and there is never a time that I go back into uh, learning sequences that I don't learn something new. And part of it's because of my experience as an educator. I'm always growing and changing and, and evolving. And so my experience brings new meaning to some of the things that he's writing about. But I found this fascinating that when he gets to the tonalities, he doesn't mention pitch center anymore. He talks uh, directly about tonic, subtonic, and subdominant for mixolydian, and then characteristic tone. 
And I find that really fascinating that we don't really talk about pitch center. Um, and I'm not sure, I'd, I'd wish I would have had a conversation as to the why. Maybe it's that we already assume if they can audit pitch center in a major and minor that they will uh, do that automatically in the other tonalities. Uh, maybe it's that the characteristic tone really helps them to understand the tonality as it is. So it's just something that fascinated me as I was going through uh, my own notes and reading. Uh, and then I just put Dorian as one more as example. Uh, again, you can reference all of this in the book in terms of the, the tonal learning sequence. Um, why do I present this to you? The, the main reason, again, when I'm working with uh, teachers and I'm observing teachers or I'm working with student teachers is that uh, everything we do with students needs to be purposeful in terms of where they are in their audition journey and what will help them move on their audition journey. So if I'm working with a new set of kindergartners in September, I probably don't want to start with singing uh, tonic dominant and subdominant chords to my or uh, patterns to my students. I want to start working on having them audiate pitch center. Uh, I want them to start audiating resting tone and then moving into tonic chords. And the first, uh, excuse me, I keep saying chords and I really mean patterns. Um, their first patterns that they should be singing for me should be tonic patterns before I move into dominant patterns. And so often when I when I'm Again, observing, I hear people just pulling out patterns from their own audiation because their level of musicianship is so much more developed than their students. And so to ask a five or a six year old to sing bum, 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 when they've not really mastered singing bum, 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 or mastered audiating bum, 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 or they don't have a foundation for audiating bum, 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 bum. If they don't have that foundation uh, listening vocabulary, then asking them to sing those things is going to be all the more difficult. So I really think it's important that we understand that there is a learning sequence for tonality. Uh, just the same, there is a rhythm learning sequence. When he uh, talks about duple meter, again, I found this so fascinating. I've read this book so many times, I did not, I don't ever remember seeing the word movement in terms of the rhythm learning sequence. Uh, and so when I was going through the 2012 version last night, seeing that movement just made my heart uh, skip a beat because movement is in, uh, integral to the development of a child's audiation, both tonally and rhythmically, more so rhythmically. So he talks about movement first. He always lists macro beats than micro beats. I, you can see it on the screen that I switch those, and I did so purposely because in my own work over over twenty plus years of teaching, what I find is that my little ones always move to micro beats before they move to macro beats, and so I meet them where they are, and I'm going to pull them out of their own subjective. Uh, meter understanding and pull them into macro beats. So I put that, I switched that very purposely, but I know, want you to know that he uh, lists that differently. And then from macro and micro beats, we go into divisions. Uh, again, a funny distinction. He writes divisions, then divisions and elongations, and then elongations. Uh, and I found that fascinating how he distinguished uh, between those things. Same thing to be true of triple meter movement, then macro and micro division, division elongations and elongations. Uh, and then you can see unusual and unusual paired uh, similar thing, but not mentioning movement again. So I'm curious as to the why. Uh, but uh, my assumption is that if they're, if they're moving, if they've coordinated movement in their chanting, then they probably are in duple and triple meter, then they're doing that in, in uh, more difficult settings with different tonalities or meter. Uh, Jen, can I ask a question? Oh, we have, no. first of all, we have, we have a couple questions uh, 
from the from the chat, but one question. So in regards to microbeats before macrobeats, does that come out of your work in early childhood? Because I know when I took my early childhood level, uh, so they, they begin with flow and then they superimpose the microbeats on top of that flow and then get to macrobeat, aka steady beat. That is that is how I uh work with my children. Uh, so I guess my putting micros before macros is really framing it in the sense of children who are learning to audiate, who are just on the cusp of being ready for formal instruction, really uh, feel micro beats before macro beats. Uh, if we're talking about the formal instruction uh, like we're doing in learning sequences, then it would be macro beats and micro beats, um, uh, micro beats, macros then micros. But the interesting thing, uh, when you look at his rhythm LSAs, the easy patterns are micro beat patterns. The difficult pattern is a macro beat pattern. So uh, I feel that kind of supports my mindset of micro tends to be uh, easier for for kids. Uh, to match. There was some work done by Daryl Walters, uh, who was a professor at uh, Temple University, that looked at um, children's heartbeat and uh, their natural rhythm, like their tempo, and found that the kids most often their personal tempo uh, kind of drove where they, they lived in terms of um, chanting and, and things like that. And so I think there's a lot to be explored there. Um, but that's just my observation with, with working with little ones. When I'm working with five-year-olds coming into my classroom for the first time, we're, we're really moving to micros before we're moving to macros. And one quick question, going back a little bit, uh, Jean, Jean Whaley asks, how much do you find that mastery sticks over breaks in summer and that uh, do you find that you need to go back to pitch center in the fall with first or second graders? I uh, will always go back to pitch center or resting tone with my uh, first and second graders. I don't think, and we'll talk, you'll get more of this as we get in. I don't think you can ever, ever give enough uh, instructional time to oral, oral and verbal association and working with building a strong tonal and rhythmic foundation vocabulary with your students. Um, and so I will revisit and revisit and revisit as much as I can until, until it starts to become natural for them. And what I have found in my work is so often it's about third grade where the kids start to take those processes on their own, where I don't have to revisit resting tone and I don't have to revisit tonic and, and dominant explicitly that they start to um, take those things and make meaning for themselves and apply it into the music that they're listening to. Uh, and I find that to be fascinating because it's right on the cusp of when audiation stabilizes. Your third graders are mostly eight going into nine-year-olds. And so uh, I'm always fascinated by the fact that it's about third grade for me where they really, it starts to all stick. But I will never apologize for a moment of, of time spent in my classroom working at uh, our oral with my kids and really uh, setting their foundation for their uh thinking and uh, listening and speaking vocabularies. Any other questions? We're good? Uh, I think we're good. That's it for now. Awesome. All right, so moving on we've, we, from tonal and rhythm learning sequences, the, the last one I want to talk about is pattern learning sequence. And it, it almost felt when I was learning uh, about music learning theory redundant. Like why do we need a tonal learning sequence, a rhythm learning sequence, and now I have to have a pattern learning sequence too? But uh, when you think about this, and, and if you've taught the LSAs uh, long enough, I think you'll find uh, the reason why, which is pattern learning sequence has to do with the context, the tonality and the meter, uh, and the content that you're going to teach, which is the functions within. And then within those functions, so within every tonic function in major, there are patterns that have different 
levels of difficulty to audiate. Now, I'm going to say this again because I think this is so very important. Within major tonic function, there are, I mean, think about it. You could probably sing for me 10 different tonic patterns right now. Some of you might be audiating them uh, as I'm speaking to you. Within those patterns that we audiate, major tonic, every one of those patterns has a, an item difficulty. It's either easy to audiate, it's what he would call moderately difficult to, to audiate, or difficult to audiate. And I make this distinction because there are so many instances in, in the um, learning sequence activities when I'm doing a pattern page where an easy pattern throws my students. They just cannot chant or sing the pattern back to me, but it's the easy pattern. And the thing that I have to remind myself, and this is why I included this so explicitly, is that there is a huge difference between easy to audiate and easy to perform. So it may be easy to audiate to think the pattern, but then getting the pattern out of the mouth can be a little bit more challenging. And so uh, I think it's really important to be aware that uh, that all of these, he analyzed all of these patterns and looked at what are the ones that are easy, what are the ones that are kind of in the middle, and what are the ones that are really challenging, and then making sure that we're purposeful in our instruction with our students. If I'm giving my kids all of the difficult patterns to audiate and, uh, and never giving them some easy, that's going to be a cause for frustration for some kids that struggle to audiate, who may not have the aptitude to audiate at a high level. And so just being aware of that, um, and I could talk a couple hours about this in and of itself, I think is so important to remember. Um, Marilyn is asking, what is your source for patterns? And I think maybe other people might be asking, well, how do you find out the difficulty levels of said patterns? Because I know it's not currently in the 2012 edition of Learning Sequences it's and Music. Not. And in fact, what I tend to look at uh, as a reference, I'll, uh, oh goodness, I wish I had it with me uh, here. Um, I love to look at his uh, PMMA, MIMMA, um, uh, what's the word for it? I'm totally blanking. Um, the manuals? Yeah, the manuals, because he does list uh, patterns in there. Um, you can get, you can access his uh, item difficulty and patterns through um, the USC library. In older versions of the book, he did have pattern uh, difficulty, and I have to go back and, and be able to give you the exact resources that you can look at to see those things. But I just think it's really important to be mindful again that. Uh, Easy to audiate is not easy to perform, and that we are really purposeful not only in the sequence of our patterning, but also the um, you know the difficulty of the audiation of that pattern. So let me uh, when I get Andy uh, notes to this work uh, to this uh, PowerPoint, I will cite those resources so that you can look those up and, and have access to them. Sounds great. Thanks. Okay. All right. So putting it all together, why did we talk about this? If I want to help my students audiate at their fullest potential, I have to take into account, number one, their aptitude, which I think most MLT people buy into the notion that we need to look at a child's aptitude in order to uh, create instruction that is tailored to who they are as a musician and guide them. Um, but we also have to guide them using a skill learning sequence, which is discrimination and inference learning. And we do that in conjunction with our tonal and rhythm learning sequence and pattern learning sequence. That's a huge sentence. It's a lot to take in all at once. Uh, and I'm gonna try and break down how I do it in a very, uh, manageable way as we uh, continue our journey, journey this morning so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming uh, for all of us. I'm giving you 23 years of mistakes of MLT <laughs> teaching. Uh, learn, from, learn from my mistakes. So, so uh, I'm going to start with learning sequence activities because the reality is if we aptitude test our students, 
uh, we do LSAs. Uh, otherwise, there's no point in doing the aptitude testing. Um, so what really happens in our classrooms? And I'm going to be brutally honest. We test our kids. It takes two class periods. It's a lot of instruction time to give up, especially if you're only seeing your kids once or uh, once a week. Uh, from there, we score the tests. We analyze the data. And if you're me, you might drink a little wine while you're doing all of that. Because again, if you have 500 students, that's a thousand tests that you are scoring. Uh, and it is a lot of work to go through that. From there, you're going to create your color coordinated seating charts. And I say color coordinated because that's kind of the world I live in. Uh, when I learned to do all of this, we put lines above the name of the child who had high aptitude. We put a line below the name of the child who had low aptitude. And you just hope that the kid never saw the seating chart. Well, the reality is they do. So I color coordinate it. And, uh, and that makes it a little less... Uh, I don't know. The kids don't really care about that as much as why do I have a line under my name? Uh, and then from there, after you you get that all done, and this is this is like a solid three works three weeks worth of uh, work outside of your classroom teaching, outside of your lesson planning, outside of your performances, outside of your family time. Then you go in and you start doing LSAs, and, and I'm being really strong in my words here, but then we go in and we kind of drill and kill the joy out of music learning with pattern instruction. And I say this only because I've talked again to so many teachers that say, I have been teaching 1A1 for four weeks and my kids still aren't at 80% of the kids learning this. And I thought, goodness gracious, if you've been doing that for four weeks, let it go. They're not ready for it. They're not ready for it. So please, if you're gonna do pattern instruction, uh, I really want you to make sure that you have spent some time with your students uh, building their vocabulary. I don't, I don't uh, test my kindergartners at all. I spend my entire first year of kindergarten just immersing kids in music. Uh, and in fact, if you know, if you've, if you've taken levels with me or have read my blog, you know that I, I don't um, have my children sing or chant for the first six weeks of school, which is a pretty tough stance to have um, because the little ones love to talk and they love to sing and they love to participate. And my kids do all of that. They uh, participate in music for their entire time in my room, their 40 minutes of instruction, they're participating. They always have a job. Their job is audiating. Their job is identifying sameness and difference. Their job is moving. Uh, they always have something they're supposed to do. I just don't have them sing and chant for the first six weeks. And the reason I'm trying to do that, or the reason I do it, not try, um, is that I want to build a vocabulary in their audiation, I need a baseline uh, listening vocabulary in my students. And what I have found over the years of teaching and probably more so now than ever, is that my children come to me at their musical births. It used to be that I might have a 50-50 ratio of kids who came in who were ready for music instruction because they're home, they, they, um, they sing in the home, they moved in the home, they, um, went to a baby music class, uh, what have you. Uh, now my students come to me and uh, we, can't, we can't sit still. We don't know how to sit on a carpet with our legs crossed. We don't know how to keep our hands to ourselves. We've been raised by an iPad more so than anything. And so I really have made it a, a point to create space in my teaching so that my little ones all come and have an opportunity to just listen and build a, a listening and a speaking vocabulary, which will serve us into our thinking vocabulary as we move along. Um, so I don't do any LSAs in uh, kindergarten. I don't test aptitude in kindergarten. That all starts in first grade. And then when I do that, I'm very, very purposeful in the way I give instruction. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now. Does anybody have questions? Did I shock anybody by saying I don't? Not my little ones. <laughs> I, just, 
<laughs> no, we have uh, we have an oh mercy yes. I think that that's in response to your 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 kindergarten philosophy. Uh, Robert asks which tests for a general class of twenty four fourth to sixth graders would you use, and also which test for small groups of three to five year old piano students. Do you want to just speak briefly yeah. about uh, the aptitude tests uh, you use? So uh, I will tell you in my own mm -hmm. teaching. Um, if I'm, if I, in years past when I have tested uh, kindergarten, kindergarten and first grade, I only use PMMA. And the truth be told, PMMA is probably a little too easy for my first graders. I don't, uh, I really don't get that bell curve uh, from my kids in there. I get a lot of kids that will score high. But I also find that if, when I've tried to test uh, IMMA with first grade, which it's, um, it's normed. Oh gosh, is it normed? I can't remember. Um, I just, it's too challenging. So first grade's a little bit of a, a, a tough grade for me, but I do use PMMA for them. Um, I don't use IMMA. IMMA is second grade through fourth grade. I used to do IMMA through fifth grade. And what I found is that my fifth graders just had uh, testing fatigue. Uh, they had already taken it in second grade and third grade and fourth grade. And by the time they got to me in fifth grade, they uh, they didn't want to engage. It felt babyish to them. They didn't uh, they would not pay attention and uh, erroneously score low, even though I had, you know, 40 years of data to tell me what their aptitudes really were. Um, if I if I had all the time in the world, I would use MAP with my fifth and sixth graders. Um, but it is a, it's a music aptitude profile. It's, it is truly the Cadillac of aptitude testing. Uh, but it is a very, um, uh, time consuming test because, uh, you need 50 minute blocks to get, to get things done. And it, it just, and it's at least three days of testing. Um, and so that makes it a little bit challenging. Um, if I were going to look at testing, if I was working with three to five year olds, as Robert said, um, there is uh, Audi, which uh, can be used in early childhood. The challenge with Audi is that you have to play, it's a game in, in a sense where the kids hear uh, a pattern and then they have to remember that pattern and compare it against patterns that they're going to hear. And you play it, there are only 10 patterns, so it's not a long test, but you have to play it a couple of times to really get uh, uh, meaningful data. I've administered it to my own child and to my niece, uh, and I found it to be a little, um, what's, I, I, I got good data, but I, 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 again, it's a lot of time to devote to getting an aptitude score that I already know is developmental in nature. Can I say that? And if I have, to, I guess in my mind, if if I had time to test to get a developmental uh, aptitude score from a three-year-old or time to just invest in that three-year-old's uh, music foundation in terms of singing and chanting and moving and building their thinking and speaking vocabularies, I think time invested there is better than um, doing Audi. And it's not, it's not anything against that. I just think uh, in all things, my mind is always thoughtful of, I only have X amount of minutes with this child. It's not, uh, it's not the same as a classroom teacher who can teach a math lesson for 50 minutes every day and go back and, and fill in holes. I, I have to be so efficient and so mindful of everything and purposeful of everything I teach because I only get to see my kids uh, once every three days or once a week. And so I think it's just uh, a matter of where and how you want to invest your time. Um, I would not do PMMA with three-year-olds. I think it's way too long. It's 40 items. It takes 10 minutes to administer uh, one of the tests. And the truth is it's really 20 minutes by the time you get through directions and everything like that. Um, so again, you can look at Audi or you can, um, uh, you know, just evaluate how you want to use your time to really, uh, build that child's musicianship and guide it. And so I hope that answers the question. That's great. Thanks. Okay.
So I'm going to talk about uh, LSAs. And uh, I have classroom expectations for LSAs. I have student expectations. And, uh, and the truth is I have teacher expectations. When I uh, did my um, level two general music certification, I really was reflective about my practice because I just felt like my LSA, I wasn't getting the best out of my LSAs that I could. And I found that my kids' interest was waning and that uh, it just always felt like an uphill battle. And so I came away from that um, certification really with a few things in mind that I wanted to hold myself accountable to. Uh, one is that I wanted student expectations that were on the board for every LSA um, uh, uh, class period or you know, mo or time that we devoted for LSAs that these, this was on the board so that the students knew what the expectations were um, and they knew what I wanted from them while we were doing this. So on uh, the left-hand side, you can see that I have no side conversations that they have to keep their hands to their uh, to self, um, and then that I will only do LSAs for five minutes only. Um, so I want you to think about: it. I have a forty-minute class, and uh, you know, doing LSAs for ten minutes of a forty-minute class does not feel fun to anybody. <laughs> so uh, in committing to my students that I was only going to do five minutes of learning sequence activities, it made me become extremely. Uh, efficient at how I delivered pattern instruction. Uh, so here are the expectations I had of myself. Uh, I was always going to do pattern instruction in the first five minutes of the classroom. Um, and I kept, and the first year after my level two, I set a timer every time I did LSAs to keep me honest. Um, and this is way back before we had smart boards and we had iPhones and all of those things. So I had a little mouse timer that sat on my piano and I clicked it for five minutes. And when it rang, we were done. And, uh, and I went to the point where I, in, I become so efficient at this that I can do most pages in four and a half minutes and, and be done. Um, and I say first five minutes of classroom instruction. I have tried to do LSAs in different areas of my um, lesson. I've tried to do it in the middle of the lesson. I've tried to do it at the end of the lesson. You will never have better engagement than you do when your kids walk in the room. It's just the truth. And so I, even though I've tried to play with it at different times of my lesson, uh, I have found consistently that the that first few minutes of uh, class time is the best time to get LSAs done. That's my personal preference. You might find something different, but that's where I landed with that. Uh, the second thing. Do you thing, have some kind of a? I'm sorry. Do you have some kind of a, a hello song or a welcome song when they come in, or they just come in, boom, sit down, and you're going to eat your vegetables before you get your dessert? Yes, yes. I I used to try and do the hello song and things like, like that. And again, what I found is that if I started to do hello songs and I added some movement to it, somebody got a little bit silly and then I had to pull that back in before we went into our vegetables. Uh, and so I, it, it does not sound like it's a very musical way to begin a music class. Uh, but I will tell you that I greet my children in the hallway and I sing hello as they're coming in and I notice things about my kids. Like I really make an, an effort to uh, create a warm environment uh, right outside of the hall and as they come in and then we, as soon as they're in their row seats, we go right into pattern instruction. Uh, and again, it's my personal preference. I've tried many different things over the years to do it differently because it, not, it, it didn't feel good to come in and not sing a hello song or to do something else. Um, but again, this is the most important. I mean, like these five minutes are sacred in my classroom and I wanna make sure that my kids are getting the most out of it as they can. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is that I have tried other seating arrangements. I tried to have them come and sit uh, around our circle and do that instead of being in row seats because what the reality is is that I add a transition to the uh, instructional block and you know that you lose kids during uh, transitions and so they come in they sit in their row seats in front of the board and then we have to move into our circle seats and I you know behavior issues arise so I tried to do it in circle seats and what I found is that I have to have my back to somebody if I'm doing patterns uh, in a circle formation and the behavior challenges uh, in a circle formation were greater than if I dealt with it in a transition. So I've stayed with row seats all of these years because 
I've just not been able to find another way to uh, hold and manage 22 to 28 kids in LSAs um, more efficiently or effectively than row seats. The last thing I, I will say to you is that uh, over the years, I have really worked hard to not have LSAs be this island unto themselves. So they come in, they do the pattern work with me, and then we go do all of the fun things. And there's no connection between the LSA and the classroom activity. I think you have to be very meaningful and purposeful in finding connections between what the LSA is and then into something that you're doing in the classroom activity. So they understand the importance of the learning sequence activity in their overall instruction. And so anything you can do to connect, uh, to make connections uh, for them or help them to see the connections, I think it will only help them buy into the importance of the LSAs. Uh, Robert asks, uh, you only do one per class, and by that he means you you just do rhythm one day and you just do tonal the next day. And I would assume that that, that that answer is yes, just one or the other. And the other is reinforced in classroom activities. Would you speak a little bit about uh, how you make connections to previous LSAs in classroom activities, or perhaps you're gonna be covering that at some point already? I'm gonna cover that uh, a little bit further, but I will say that I only do one LSA page in my 40-minute uh, block with students in my instructional block. And if I'm committed to doing, if I'm doing uh, a rhythm page, I do that uh, rhythm page uh, until it's finished. So if um, if I'm doing, let's say, 2A1 with my kids, they come in one day, we start the page, they come in the next day, we finish the page. I don't go back and forth between tonal and rhythm. I like for them to, I don't go back and forth before the page is done. Let me clarify. Uh, I like them to be solid in that, um, in that, uh, uh, what do I want to say? Like there's that learning sequence before we move to something else. If I'm doing uh, a rhythm page in my classroom instruction, then more likely than not, my classroom activities has some tonal work in it so that they're getting a balance of tonal and rhythmic um, instruction. It's just one's happening as an LSA and the other one's happening as uh, a classroom activity, if that makes sense. Uh, and you're probably going to cover this later, but Tyler asks, do you modify the LSA sequence from the register books? Yes. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> and yes, I, I, figured, <laughs> I figured. And then Kristen asks, uh, can you give an example of a connection you would make uh, with the LSAs in the classroom activities? And again, I, uh, you said you're going to be getting that at some point. I'm going to come back to that. But uh, so let me just give you a quick example. If I'm looking, uh, I'm thinking about tonal pattern. Um, I've got my books in front of me. Uh, tonal unit two, verbal association, and they're learning to do uh, function for the first time or something. I don't maybe that's not tonal unit two. Maybe it's uh, tonal unit five. Okay, so they're learning to do function for the very first time. So, so fa, mi, re, ti, do. Uh, and we're gonna learn that every pattern that has do, mi, or so is major tonic. And every pattern that has so fa, re, ti is no. So we uh, will do that. And then in a classroom activity, <laughs> Uh, I will come back to that. I don't do it the same class, but in a classroom activity uh, in a day or two after, we might come back and play, I call it walk the plank in my room, but we'll play the little game where every time I say, do me or so, you're going to jump and say major tonic. And every time I sing a pattern that has so fa, re, ti, or la, fa, do, you're not going to jump, you're not going to flinch, you're not going to move, because if you do, you're out. So I'll come back and revisit those as little games in my room so that they get it more than just for 10 minutes of instruction. Because the reality is they, they need to revisit those kinds of things over and over again for it to really stick. So we play little games to embed some pattern work and instruction in subsequent lessons. Um, and so that it's not just a one and done. We're getting a big thumbs up on loving the game, Walk the Plank, and that's available in your Teachers Pay Teacher store? That is not. I, I wish I knew. I, I want to say that this was a game that I learned from Kelly Graham, and maybe she's, 
I, I'm hoping she's the originator of this game. Um, but it's, you know, one of those things that when you go to workshops and somebody uh, does a fun little share of an activity they've done. Uh, and so, um, uh, the game that I play with the kids actually jumping and moving and, and they sit, we call it walk the plank because uh, I'm usually singing some little sea chant ditty or something at about the same time we do this game. Uh, if they get it wrong, they walk the plank and they're out. Uh, there is there is an LSA game that I do have in Teachers by Teachers where they can do this, they can, the same game and audiating patterns uh, and it's a little PowerPoint game, but it's different than just having them jump in and move. But that is in the TPT store. So. Great. Okay, moving on. All right, so I'm going to share with you how I, I set up a, a LSA and I'm, I'm I'm going to be really honest in what I do, and I'm giving you as best as I can kind of here's what it looks like. But the reality is, you know, in everything that I do, there's going to be some wiggle room. So day one, I'm going to set up my page. Uh, and the first thing I want you to do, please, if you walk away with no other takeaway today, uh, besides the difference between discrimination and inference learning, please give your instructions for the LSA page before you establish the context. There are so many times I hear somebody go, okay, boys and girls, I'm going to sing these patterns to you. So they, they establish context and then they go right into talking, which is what what's the point of establishing context if you're going to break it. So give the directions for the LSA page, then establish your context, whether it's ba 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 so uh, after you establish context, then I go into my pattern instruction and uh, I give lots of classroom patterns. That's not um, reflected in what I've written here for you, but I always start with classroom patterns. From there, I go right into teaching mode to my high aptitude kids first. And the reason I do that is I have to get them through more patterns than anybody else. So my high aptitude kids right off the bat get teaching mode. And then once they've all had teaching mode and I'm again, I'm interspersing classroom patterns left and right. Then I go to my kids who uh, have average aptitude. My low kids almost never get pattern instruction on the, on the first day. Every once in a while at the end, uh, as long as I've gotten everybody else through things. Um, and, you know, I'll have kids remark on it. And my response is always, uh, you got exactly what you needed today. And today you needed to audit the patterns. Uh, or today, you know, today you got no patterns. Next time you're going to get two. So just be watching. <laughs> so uh, I always start with easy patterns for my high aptitude, uh, then my average, and then evaluation mode with my high aptitude. My goal in day one is to get my high kids through teaching mode in the second pattern. Um, and and that's and all of my average aptitude kids through the yeah, teaching mode in the easy pattern. So that's setting up the page. And, and again, I'm gonna do this with anywhere from, you know, my average class size is about 20, five kids. Uh, my high class, I think right now is 28. Um, it is it is very efficient instruction. There is no downtime. There is no silliness. There's no anything. Um, it is really, let's get it done. Um, and, and you can, we can actually see examples of you delivering LSAs. It says it on your previous slide. I, on your YouTube channel, you can see about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten examples of Jen teaching uh, in this very, very specific and prescripted way. And I have, I do have other videos. I just need a summer to get all of that on there. But I've been trying to videotape uh, patterns from each um, unit to just have an example like and, and please i'm just one way of doing it i i wish you could go see jill reese dr reese teach i wish you could go see dr Scholes teach i wish you could go see um you know just amazing people doing lsa so that you get to connect with the person who um most fits your your style of teaching and uh, and how you would like to build your your you know classroom environment. So I'm just providing one way, and it's not going to be the way for everybody. So please, I, I just want you to know that I'm 
Uh, I just want some, you know, sometimes you just need to see something to know, you know what, some, you know what something is by knowing what it isn't. Um, and sometimes you know how you want to teach by knowing how you don't want to teach. So uh, I think it's good to see people do it. So day one, I'm just going to set up the page. Day two, I'm going to come back to it. This is my cleanup day. I review instructions, I establish context, I go into classroom patterns, and then I'm going to start giving the evaluation mode for all of those apt, uh, average aptitude kids, teaching mode for low aptitude, and then I'm going to, again, my goal is to get those uh, high kids through teaching mode in their uh, moderate pattern, and then um, teaching and evaluation mode for their high. Uh, and I really try to get everybody through you know, like my low act two kids they're going to get through their one pattern my average kids are going to get through one and a half slash two patterns and i say one and a half meaning maybe they got teaching mode for the second pattern but not evaluation mode uh my high kids i try to get them through all three or at the at the least 2.5, which is they got teaching mode for the difficult pattern, but maybe I didn't get back to evaluation mode. Uh, this seems to work for me pretty well and, and works consistently. The only, the only LSAs I can't get done in two days, and I think it's just because of the tempo and the length of pattern is triple meter patterns always take me a little extra time. And it may just be me, but it's very hard to take a quick tempo when the pattern is ba 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 The kids can't audiate, let alone perform it either. So I have to take things a little slower for them, and that usually ends up in a third day. But otherwise, I can get a pattern page done in two days uh, on average. Uh, with the low aptitude students, do they sometimes need teaching mode more than once? Uh, they do not need teaching mode more than once. They I sometimes will have kids that need evaluation mode more than once, meaning that I've sung the pattern with them or I've chanted the pattern with them. Now it's when I go back to have them do it on their own, it's not correct. And so uh, I can give them, uh, I, or I do give them, you know, two or three tries to get, get it correct. Do you make a distinction in your markings if in the evaluation mode they sing it incorrectly? So if I've given them it in teaching mode, there's a line underneath their name. And if they've gotten it correct in evaluation mode, I uh, put a line across that line so it looks like a plus sign. If the child in evaluation mode has gotten it incorrect, then I put a dot knowing I've given them a chance that they've had a try and they didn't get it correct. And then I'll go back and again, it's the second try they get it correct. Then I put the line across that but it just helps me to see who's gotten that, that first try and, uh, and that it was incorrect. Leslie asks, have you ever had teachers or parents or administrators question you about giving more patterns to some students? No, uh, the only ones that ever question it are the kids themselves. Uh, in fact, when I, um, when I talk about learning sequence activities and, and my administrators, you know, the last, 15, 20 years have all come in and observed me teaching LSAs. And uh, when I talk to them about what I'm doing and why, they, why I'm doing it, uh, there is never any question about it because I explain that I am um, differentiating instruction for kids. And so I explain that a high child, a child, <laughs> a child with high aptitude needs a uh, more challenging uh, things or, you know, patterns that will challenge them at the level of their audiation. Uh, whereas my kids who with low aptitude are getting uh, things that are challenging them at their aptitude. But the reality is that they're all receiving the same pattern instruction in terms of the uh, orally. So they're all hearing all of these patterns. The only difference is I'm not asking a child with low aptitude to uh, discriminate or perform a pattern that is uh, beyond their uh, ability to audiate at this point. There's one question. Uh, somebody would like the clarification on the difference between teaching mode and evaluation mode. And can you give a quick example? Yeah. So if I am uh, doing a pattern page with a student, so um, let's see. Uh, if I sing, so, 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 so
uh, boys and girls, I'm going to sing this pattern. Do me. If I point to you, you're going to sing the pattern with me first or the first time. Do me. And then uh, we do it together. That's teaching mode. So, but that's only to one student. So I would look at that child and I would point to that child. They know it was their turn. Do me. I take a breath and gesture to them. Do me. They sing with me. That's teaching mode. When I come back to them the second time and I give them the same pattern, do me. That time they have to sing it by themselves. They don't sing. I don't sing with them. So teaching mode, I'm explicitly teaching them the pattern and how to sing or perform it. Evaluation mode, they're showing me that they have audited it and that they are, are capable of doing it for themselves. Uh, Follow-up question, Tyler asks, how accurate is considered correct? For example, what if a student slides into the correct pitch or misses the middle pitch slightly? So uh, that gets into these gray areas. Um, I wish I could show you a, a pattern sheet. I wish I'd prepared one to, to pop up here. Uh, so I have all of these little shortcut things that I write on my page to help me know. So let's say I'm singing, uh, do me so, and the child goes, do me so. And you, you can tell it's like, you can tell that the pattern is what it's supposed to be, but it's not in tune, or maybe they haven't coordinated breath. Uh, instead of crossing that line across, then I, I do kind of like a little squiggle, which tells me that they sing the pattern, but but they're approximating pitch or they're not coordinating breath. Like I have different things that help me understand so that then I can go back and look uh, over time uh, I can go back and look at their patterns. Usually I do this uh, like at the end of a trimester and I look and go, oh my gosh, you know what? This child consistently is struggling with uh, singing in tune, which is probably a coordination issue or an uh, audiation, you know, not having the foundation um, thinking in um, listening vocabularies. Um, so I can go back and look, or I can look and say, hey, you know, this happened one time. So maybe that kid had a cold that day, or maybe that kid's having allergies. But I have little shortcuts that I write so that I can take notes without writing explicit notes of, of what's happening in the essay, because it, it happens so quickly um, that I want to be able to notate what I heard um, and then track it over time to see if it's uh, a pattern of behavior, you know, that I have to go back and address or if it's um, just a, you know, an odd day. Robert asks, do you do evaluation mode with a student immediately following teaching mode with the same student? No. So if I do teaching mode, uh, I, so again, it depends on where you are in terms of your attitude. If you are a high aptitude kid, you probably get teaching mode about two minutes after you, or excuse me, you get evaluation mode about two minutes after you had it in teaching mode. Um, if you're an average kid, you're probably going to get evaluation mode on the second day. If you're um, my low kids, you're getting uh, teaching mode either at the end of day one or uh, beginning of day one and then or day two and then getting it at the very tail end of, of day two as well. So it just depends on the aptitude of the of the child. But I there's always space. I never go do me and have Andy sing and then go right back to Andy and go do me uh, because he needs time to think about that pattern. He needs time to audiate it. Or I'm using Andy as an example because we're talking. Um, they need space. To, to think and audiate. The other thing I, I want you to be aware, and uh, it's funny because I was talking to somebody um, who's really focusing in on uh, LSAs. I never do more than two individual patterns in a row before interspersing a classroom pattern. So if I go to Andy and I go, do me, and he sings with me, and then I go to Robert and I sing, do me, and Robert sings it, then I go to a classroom pattern, so far, Ray, and everybody sings. Um, I never do more than two, because what I find is my kids just start to check out, like, oh, we all know the pattern's gonna be do me, and th then they're not really, uh, I lose engagement. So, uh, but I think the, the books actually say you can do up to three. I, I prefer two. I think it's better to change it up and keep them on their toes. Again, it's just a personal preference thing. Any other questions? I think that's it. Uh, Jean says, my goal is getting them familiar with the process and doing some testing next year. 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The, the previous question was, I haven't had a chance to test students, but I'm noticing that I'm getting a sense of which students are high, average, low aptitude and doing lots of class patterns. So my goal is getting them familiar with the process and then doing some testing next year. So I think she's asking, uh, is she on the right track? You know, she wants to dip her toe into this and doing it a little bit step by step. I think that's a wonderful way to do it. And I would encourage you to aptitude test. And here, I, if you've taken workshops with me, you know the story, but I just, it's, it was so profound in my own teaching. And, and here's what I, I tell you. It, when you go in and work with kids, and especially like when I go into a, uh, I go into a building for the first time. So it's been, I've been in my current teaching situation for 11 years, but, uh, but when I set foot into that building for the very first time and just started musicking with them, of course, we all get uh, ideas in our in our minds about who are musical children and who are are not so musical children based on the way they engage us. And uh, and so we start to get a sense of who has high aptitude and who has low aptitude. And I just want to caution you against that in the sense that some of your highest aptitude kids will not perform for you the way that we think that they should in a musical setting because they have uh, perfectionist tendencies, uh, because their audiation functions at such a higher level than ours that sometimes they perceive what we're doing as being a little babyish. I tell the story of, of my two little uh, kids uh, at my very first school here in Farmington. I have one kid that just was amazing singer could do I mean just he was that X Factor kid had a personality bigger than life had a gorgeous singing voice and I had this little girl who was so shy she'd barely look at you she uh, wasn't a singer and and in my mind my little guy was my high aptitude kid and my little shy girl who couldn't sing was my low aptitude kid well when I aptitude tested it it turned out to be that this my my you know little rock star had the aptitude of a of a rock, and <laughs> my little quiet girl scored a perfect score tonally and rhythmically on the test, and did it every year that she had me. Well, come to find out, she was I mean she had music oozing, <clears throat> excuse me, oozing out of her, but her her um, personality being just painfully shy prevented her from wanting to sing in front of others. I could give her an instrument and she could improvise things like it was nobody's business because she could hear it all. In fact, we got her in piano lessons and, uh, and I ran into her a couple years ago and she was still playing to that day. My other little guy, I, first time I asked him to improvise, he crowed like a rooster. And I thought, are you kidding me? But his aptitude was so low, he couldn't think musically. He could imitate other people. He could sing and chant what he heard, but he couldn't audiate what he was hearing. And so um, I just, I know that people have very strong feelings about aptitude testing. Um, and I think you have to be mindful of why you're doing it and what it's gonna do. For me, aptitude testing is about informing my instruction uh, and devising uh, almost IEPs for every student in my classroom. <laughs> Um, and, uh, when done in that way, with that mindset, it, it's really, uh, it, it changes the trajectory of your teaching. So, um, I'll be really curious to know if, if what you think in terms of your kids that are musical turn out to be true and, and you might get some surprises and that'll be a lovely thing to find out that maybe somebody that wasn't expressing themselves musically in your room was actually really a high mus uh, music aptitude kid. Great, thanks. Hmm. All right. Uh, so rethinking LSAs, <laughs> I put this quote here. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I have some really healthy conversations with other MLT practitioners, and this is just a way to justify what I do. Um, <laughs> so uh, I Ed has a quote in the, the newest version that says, uh, learning sequence activities represent exemplary possibilities. Let's just think on that word for a minute. Of how music learning theory through music learning sequence may be put into practice in accord with the teacher's personal or pedagogical preferences. I, I think that's such a great thing to read. It's in the first, it's like on the first page of that chapter in the book. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And I put that there because I'm, uh, if I'm being really honest, uh, I love doing LSAs with my students. I don't love the way they're sequenced. Uh, and it's LSA books are the only things that have not been uh, edited or revamped in the entire jump writing curriculum. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit about what I do and why I do it. But the rhythm sequence, I put one through six because the reality is if you can get through one through six in elementary school, you're rocking it. Um, uh, and if you can get further, then that's even more amazing. Rhythm unit one is an aural oral page. So they're just chanting patterns and macro micro patterns. Rhythm unit two is a verbal association where they go back and repeat the patterns they did in rhythm unit one, not all, but some. Um, and they learn to label meter. So you have uh, unit uh, pages that are just uh, them chanting the whole pattern. And then there are pages where they are uh, hearing a pattern and naming the meter of the pattern. So they would say macro, micro, duple, or they would say no, or um, <clears throat> they don't want to label that other stuff until rhythm unit four. Uh, so I'm sharing this with you because down here it says rules I break. With rhythm, I always do whole pattern before naming meter and function. I have never, I understand why he did it. I just don't think it's best practice. Um, and so I just am gonna agree to disagree with, with some people, including Dr. Gordon on that one. Uh, I think it's very hard for kids to, if their very first exposure to verbal association is not chanting the pattern, but learning to uh, differentiate whether they're hearing a macro or micro pattern or no, and they've never chanted the pattern they're supposed to be separating or sorting is what we call in my classroom. It's really hard for them. And I, and I say that because I'm doing rhythm unit two as first grade. That's that's really a challenge for six year olds and seven year olds. So um, I tend to do whole pattern first so they can experience what the pattern is. And then we go into the naming of meter and function. And I call that because, again, it's hard to for I've really worked hard to find ways to help kids understand <clears throat> what it is they're doing and why they're doing it. So I say to them, you know, you sort things when you were in kindergarten, you sorted things by size, you sorted things by color, you sorted things by shape. And in music, <clears throat> sometimes we sort sounds. And so when you hear a pattern that sounds like this, do, day, do, do, day, do, we call that a macro, micro pattern. Can you all say macro, micro, duple? Say it. And if you micro duple, sorry. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> and if you hear a pattern that sounds like this, do to do 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 ta to do, you're going to sort that into the no pile because that pattern doesn't have just macro and micros. It had a ta in it. And so uh, we start by explaining, uh, kind of connecting. Like you've already sorted things in lots of different ways. Now we're going to learn how to sort sounds so that we understand what the functions are. Um. Going back rhythm unit three, our oral again, you're always gonna be cycling back to our oral. And the whole purpose is every time you go back to our oral, you're presenting new, new content. Uh, rhythm unit four is verbal association. And rhythm unit five it blows my kids out of the water because it's the first time they have to generalize. I explain generalize is translating. So now I'm gonna say this pattern, ba, 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 and you have to translate it into the solfege. Now I have a really large ESL population, so translating was the easiest way to, for them to understand and they're already grasping another language and then I'm gonna make them do something more. So uh, helping them understand that generalization is just really translating and I'm helping you to connect what you hear to the solfege so that you can, you can start to make meaning from that. Because truthfully, solfege is just a tool. We use it when we need it and then we, we don't use it when we don't need it. And then rhythm unit six is a partial synthesis unit, and it is lovely. I love partial synthesis, and we're going to talk about it a lot uh, in a little bit. So uh, my big rule that I break here is that I do whole pattern before meter and function. Uh, I do, I will be really honest. I'm sorry, MLT gods. Um, 
I, I alter some of the patterns in rhythm unit five. He's got generalization think patterns that I rhythms in those generalization pages that my kids uh, they're unfamiliar even to me. Um, they're really really hard and they they frustrate kids in a way that's pretty uh, shuts them down and sort of uh, challenges them to learn. So I do I do alter a few rhythms there, uh, but they're mostly difficult patterns that only that my high average or my high kids are getting. They're not the easy and, and moderately difficult patterns. Now, is this the first time that this, I'm kind of uh, begging the question a little bit here or uh, taunting you a little bit. Is this the first time that your students, when they get to this unit, is this the first time that they have experienced the skill of generalization? No. No, I do generalization in classroom activities. And I'm going to talk about that when we get to skill learning sequence so that you can uh, get a sense. If I were, uh, so again, if I were following uh Dr. Gordon's uh, writing to the T, uh, all new content would be introduced in learning sequences first before classroom activities. Uh, again, I, I, I'm just going to put this out there that uh, when all of this was being written, I think access to music education was still probably not what anybody would have hoped it to have been, but was probably a little bit better than what it is now. Uh, you know, when I came to my current teaching situation, I saw my kids twice a week for 40 minutes. Now I see them once every three days. And, um, and I have many colleagues that see their kids once a week for 30 minutes. Um, there is, again, there's an efficiency of instruction that I have to... Um, adhere to to get my kids moving through this sequence and audiating given the time constraints I have. So back to that quote of uh, in, in accord with the teacher's personal preference and my pedagogic, you know, pedagogical preferences, I oftentimes, not always, but I oftentimes will introduce uh, certain things in classroom activities before I do it in learning sequence activities. Because where it falls in that continuum, like again, if I generalization uh, rhythm, if I go back to that, rhythm unit five doesn't occur in my, my instruction, doesn't matter how efficient I try to be, does not happen until third grade. I think that's too long for kids to learn how to use Solfege as a tool. I really, I don't think that is helpful to any anyone to wait that long in the sequence. Uh, and, and truth be told, I don't teach rhythm unit one. My kindergartners get an extreme foundation rhythmically and tonally that whole entire year. They have heard every pattern in rhythm unit one from me and have chanted it. I haven't done it as an LSA, but I'm promising you they've got it. So when I start, uh, rhythm LSAs in first grade with their aptitude scores, we start at rhythm unit two. And still I'm only getting to rhythm unit five in, in third grade. So uh, there are things I just, I feel uh, really passionate about uh, spiraling instruction a tad bit quicker and then coming back up, but always coming back to our, our own verbal association to really make sure that I am honoring the sequence. Uh, I know, uh, Andy, that you had talked about a break. Can I finish this before we go? Uh, I think we're going to go till 10.30 okay. and then take a 15-minute break at that point. Perfect. I just want to make sure I was honoring what, what the plan was. Yeah. Uh, and, and then there's a quick question here. For tonal rules you break, Tyler asks, uh, you don't do first pitch, but you do do those pages as whole pattern? Did he hear you correctly? Uh, let me, so I'm going to clarify that right now. So uh, when I look at my tonal, tonal unit, same thing. Uh, my kindergartners have gotten a, fin, uh, <laughs> if I can say so myself, they've gotten a great foundation in kindergarten. Uh, I don't typically do tonal unit one with my, with my first graders because they've already uh, experienced all of that in kindergarten, not as an LSA, but uh, just informally. Um, when, when I do start LSAs uh, in first grade, we start with tonal unit two. Uh, 
And if you look at 2A1, if you have your book anywhere near you, 2A1 is they uh, were in verbal association. And the very first thing we ask kids to do is to name the tonality and function of the patterns. Uh, I don't think that's very helpful. Tonal unit two, uh, B1, so I'm staying in major. Uh, then they sing only the first pitch of the tonal pattern. I think first pitch is a technique we use to teach kids to listen. I don't know that it's super helpful in helping a child audiate. That's my personal opinion. I know many people have very different opinions than me. Tonal unit B2, still staying in the major track, is uh, the teacher sings the pattern and the student only sings the resting tone. The first time a child sings a whole pattern using solfege is 2B3. So I tend to do this backwards. I start with the child sings the whole pattern, the child sings the resting tone, I don't do first pitch, and then I have them do function. It's just my personal preference in terms of how I feel my kids learn best. And I do, when I do tonal unit two, I do all the major pages, and then I go back and do all the minor pages. I don't go back and forth major, minor, major, minor, major, minor. Because again, I, they're, they're hearing so fresh for the very first time and, and I need them to be solid have a solid foundation and major before I start going back and forth between two different things. And those are the same types of activities you do in kindergarten, but you do them oral, oral, and just in the form of classroom activities. Yes. Yeah. Does that help everybody to kind of understand? Uh, it, and again, this is just my process. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just my personal and pedagogical preference. I just keep quoting that. I may get that tattooed on me. Uh, Dr. Gordon's, I won't really, but uh, I love that quote because it helps me feel better about what I'm doing. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is <clears throat> Tonal Unit 3 is a creativity and improvisation page or uh, unit. And that one is, again, that would be working with first graders asking them to create and improvise using solfege. Uh, this is what that page usually sounds like. Um, so la, so fa, mi, re, ti, do. Uh, sorry, I should have given you directions first. I'm gonna sing some patterns and you can sing any other pattern that you want. It just has to be different than mine. So first pattern, mi, so. And what happens almost always is the child goes, so me. They sing the exact same pattern and they just change the syllable placement, not the pitch of the, the syllable. So uh, I find tonal unit three to be really challenging and, and almost a waste of instructional time. I come back to it. I will do tonal unit four and tonal unit five and come back to tonal unit three before doing partial synthesis. I just don't find it to be, uh, I, my kids really, really struggle. That's not to say that I don't do creativity and improvisation in classroom activities to help, but the, the, it's for me, it's the coordination of the verbal part. I find that my kids can improvise patterns really well. It's the coordinating solfege with it when they just learned solfege two weeks ago uh, that really is a challenge for them. And I'm, I'm not against giving my kids challenges, uh, but at the point that it's frustra frustrating them into not wanting to participate in LSAs, I have to make a decision about what's best in instructionally for my kids. So I delay tonal unit three. I come back to it, but I don't do it. Uh, uh, in sequence. Any questions? <clears throat> uh, Rachel asks, I get to see my 4K students once a week for 30 minutes. I've toyed with the idea of introducing the PMMA and LSAs during the second semester of kindergarten. Thoughts? Uh, Rachel, how often do you see your kids? Sure. 
She hasn't answered. While she's answering, Marilyn asks, Marilyn Lowe asks, Andy, do you have the pamphlet handy? Quick and easy introductions, page 22, starting with skill and function introduced in LSA, tonality and meter introduced in classroom activities before it is used. Uh, so is she talking about the blue? I think the free thing that comes from GIA, I believe that's what okay. she's saying. I don't have that handy to reference. I would love to to go back and see that. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I can look over the break and we can revisit that. Yeah. Uh, but Rachel says I see them twice a week for thirty minutes each. Um, I so <clears throat> the best answer I can give to you, Rachel, is that you know your students better than anyone, and if you feel that um, musically that they are. Um, singing and coordinating their breath and their movement and their singing and they're coordinating their breath and their movement and their uh, chanting and that they have a you know a, a good uh, tonal vocabulary and rhythm vocabulary that going ahead and moving forward with that is not problematic at all uh, when I was in uh, Philadelphia I taught at a friend's school and um, this is a school, a private school, but, you know, I had kids that started, I think, uh, I want to say preschool students, but uh, so they had preschool and kindergarten kids that had received music. And by the time I got them in kindergarten, uh, my kids were ready for for uh, aptitude testing. So I, I could get uh, good data from them and, and begin LSAs with them. And I did it the second half of kindergarten. Um, so I don't see anything wrong with it. You just have to know your kids and, and, and make a judgment based on what you, what you feel is their readiness for it. Uh, is there something that you want to get done before the break? We do have another question. Go for it. Uh, the question is from uh, Lintz. I believe it's Lintz. Uh, do you ever repeat an LSA in multiple grades? In my school, we get a lot of new or transient fifth graders wondering about different ways to onboard them to LSAs. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I don't, and I will tell you, I have a, a fairly transient population as well. Um, over forty-five percent of my school uh, is um, uh, Indian, uh, and uh, it is uh, almost on a weekly basis. I have a new student or two or five, and. Uh, I have found that trying to assimilate them into all of this can, um, is, is a challenge. Um, my kids with uh, average and high aptitude will assimilate pretty easily and pretty quickly. Uh, it's my low kids that really struggle. Um, and I can do a little one-on-one -on -one with them uh, every once in a while, but the reality is it's, it's really not even an effective use of their time because most of them have language barriers that they're, I mean, there's multiple things that we're fighting. So I, I don't go back and reteach uh, LSA pages. Every once in a while, I'm at the beginning of the year, I might review, like if we're right on the edge of, of something really challenging. So if I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to go back here, was it? Yeah, Rhythm Unit 5, Generalization, Verbal, uh, I might do a verbal association page just to kind of get their memories going about like, oh, remember how we did all of this, you know, chanting and stuff, and now we're gonna learn how to translate. So just as a little refresher that way, but I almost never reteach a page. And the only, I, I take that back. The only time I reteach a page is if the, the page completely crashed and burned. And uh, and then that would inform my instruction that I there's there are other weaknesses uh, that I need to address in a classroom instruction before I come back to that page again. Um, but otherwise, no, I just, I keep going. I think what Marilyn is saying is that, well, we talked about that you introduce, uh, according to the rules that you introduce a skill in learning sequence activity, but that tonality and meter are introduced in classroom activities before they're used in learning sequence activities. I think that she was just asking for that to be clarified. Thank you. And I think when you think of like rote song procedure, where you um, identify tonality and meter through rote song procedure, and that's a classroom activity, that's a great example of how you do that before moving into an LSA. 
And uh, I can't see comments, but I'm hoping that that's uh, what uh, Marilyn is, you know, that's one example of what she's referring to. Um, so I think this is a good place to stop, <laughs> unless there's another question. And when we come back, we can pick up the skill learning sequence and, and finish with uh, the rest. Uh, that sounds great. Uh, so we'll take a 15 minute break and we'll resume at uh, roughly 1045. Get yourself a cup of coffee or use the restroom and we'll see you back here soon. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you.